Our nation pushes for democracy throughout the world. The Founding Fathers said that it always ends in tyranny. But what does God's Word say? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jake Juan Underwood. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. The Founding Fathers had a real understanding that, that democracy is not a good form of government because it always ends in tyranny. And, you know, we're recording this podcast in the middle of a you know, pres- presidential shift where, where Joe Biden has been forced out of the, out of the campaign by a, by a small handful of people, essentially. And they've ignored the votes of 14 million or so Democratic primary voters that all said they wanted Joe Biden to be the, the nominee. Now, when they vote, they're actually voting for a representative, but that representative isn't supposed to like actually represent them. He's just they're just supposed to be blind followers that just you know stamp what whatever they're told to stamp, which is basically that Joe Biden would be the presidential you know nominee, even if he's clearly senile and he clearly has dementia. And, it doesn't matter. They were still supposed to vote for him. But a few people step in and turn the the mass of people and overnight all of a sudden Kamala Harris is the is the nominee. And this is this is how this is why or an example of why the, the founding fathers really saw democracy as a problem. So how did how does it work that this causes that problem? Well I think before we can answer that, I mean we it's probably worth clarifying some of these terms because they're terms that are thrown around a lot, but they're not always used precisely. They're rarely used precisely uh, because it was a few years ago, I think as some senator or something was saying, America is not a democracy, it's a republic. And even the fact checkers were coming and saying, this is false. America is a democracy. But the truth is that he ac- actually was right because if you go back to the, the, the meaning of those terms, you know, a democracy is where you have a government by the people directly. So it's a government where, you know, they had, I think in Athens is probably the most famous democracy where the decisions were made by the entire, get all the citizens of the town together and they vote on what they want to do. And that's what they're supposed to do. So that's a democracy or a pure democracy versus a republic is where you have the people elect representatives who make the decisions for the government. And so America is a republic, or you could call it a representative democracy, where it is the government starts with the people and then they elect their representatives. But a representative democracy is very different from a pure democracy. And but but a lot of times the terms are muddy these days and people want to pretend like we are a democracy where the representatives are only supposed to do what the people tell them to do and not exercise their own judgment. And what that means is that you end up just having the people be this, you know, we just accept whatever we're told, which means that if you have a charismatic person that's shifting the the view of the population, then your government policies change. And that's the, the core problem with a democracy is that it's emotion-based rather than reason-based. And when you're saying that democracies end in tyranny, it can be just the tyranny of the mob, or it can be the tyranny, or frequently there's a well, tyranny the, of the mob, and then the mob appoints someone it actually works the other way around, right? Because the reality is that mobs always have a tyrant that leads them. Sure. Lead them. Mobs. There's somebody cheering. Let's take the. Let's break into the Capitol. Let's. Let's. Right. Let's. There's the leaders of a mob that use the mob then to say that it's a democratic action. That it's the people that are doing it. But it's the leaders of the mob that are doing it, and they're the ones that really do it. And and you know the best example that you can see of this is obviously in Scripture, which is Christ. Right when Christ comes into Jerusalem the week before he's crucified, this is this is the response of the people. John twelve, twelve to thirteen. And the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. This is what they're saying just a few days before. But it's not that long before they're saying what it says in John 19, right? This is within a week. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. 
Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answers, We have no king but Caesar. So they went a week before all the people are saying, Jesus is king. And then a week later, they're all going, we have no king but Caesar. And so you see democracy in action, how this works, how, how a group of people can lead a mob and just completely change the direction of the mob, which is essentially what the, the chief priests do with, with Israel. And now God has a reason for it it's so that the Gentiles can come in. We can talk about you know, Romans 11 and all those things. But still, this is, this is the problem with democracy is you can get a few people that end up just changing the, the view of a mass of people very rapidly. And the people are kind of blind to it. The people in both situations think they're doing what they want to be doing. And they are doing what they want to be doing. That's just how malleable people are and how malleable our desires are. I mean, there was a video I watched this week from some guy who was talking about democracy, and he talked about that the reason why you go to something like a republic is one of the things that you have to constrain is the will of the majority. He's like, people don't recognize that you want to constrain all these other things, but you also want I me. Mean, I was talking to my kids about it this week. It's like, if you have a bunch of money, investing it keeps you from spending it or putting it in a, you know, putting it in places that regulate your ability to access it is a way of constraining yourself so that you don't go and do foolish things with your money. And there's this part of it where we just, we deny the fact that this is what people are and that they actually need to be constrained. And inherent to the idea of pure democracy is the idea that that men are perfectly good and righteous and that it's, right. it's the situation around them. So if you have people in the situation, they will choose the right thing, which is blatantly false and obviously false throughout human history. It's, it's the most obvious thing that anybody can see is that people aren't good. We did an episode on total depravity where one of the things we looked at through most of that episode was how God even has designed things so that man's sin is used to constrain man's sin and the necessity of man being constrained. Because while man's depraved, man can be held in check in a lot of different ways. And like you're saying, democracy is putting man in a position where he's open to influence from in his weak. He's making himself as a group very weak and exposing himself to the ability to be manipulated very, very easily. And they get in the position where they think, well, we have all these people, we're strong. Well, the reality is that you have somebody that has specific gifts and they have some specific position sometimes. They have, you know, they have a specific role to play. And all of a sudden, they can really shift that, that group of people. And, I mean, you see this in other places, but Nazi Germany is a case, too, where you see Hitler – I mean, the people weren't against what Hitler was doing. They were for what Hitler was doing. And he was elected. I mean, and we look and we go, democracy is the solution. Well, it's not the solution to Hitler. And kind of we started with different types of government, like republic versus democracy. But then, you know, a lot of these examples are also not in pure democracies because, you know, Germany wasn't a pure democracy. Um, you know, Israel at the time of Christ wasn't a pure democracy. But it is still this element of are you looking to the people and saying the people, you know, should should be the ones who are who are driving things. And it's something that you can have, even if you're not a pure democracy, you can be kind of leaning that direction and embracing that and saying, let's even have, you know, in certain countries have mobs, you know, say like dispense with laws because now that the mob is, is smarter than the law. And and so so it is it is it's something that it's not that you just get your form of government right and then everything else is okay. It's something you can definitely lean into in other countries like ours. And we we continue to call ourselves a representative a republic, right? We have these representatives, but the representatives are not running on the things that God says they should run on, which is character. Instead they're running on this is I will do your will. This is what you should want me to do. And so elect me because this is what I'll do. And so it's it's definitely not a pure democracy, but but the country is acting like that is the ideal. And it's a big problem to think that's the ideal because that's not the ideal at all. That's a, a, a horrible form of government. Right. You can see, like, there's, you've kind of talked about this before, that there's kind of two ways you can lead. You can either get out in front of the people and tell them, here's where we're going, and you can convince them and you can show them. Or you can see that the people are going in the direction and get out in front of them and just go in the direction they were already going and kind of corral them, but be in front of them and be their leader in that way. 
and it's a it's a double edged sword. I mean, there's a, in in John twelve forty two through forty three, you see the way that leaders can get caught up in this, even though they're a even though they're a ruler. When the people are being manipulated, when the people are being pushed in a direction, they have to be careful what they say. Actually, I would. Yeah, oh. I, I want to make a different point on this. That's that's going to make a lot more sense than that. <laughs> that's stuff like that. <laughs> Don't edit this out. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> that's right. But, is the next point in line? It's okay. All right. No, 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 but no, no, no. This is the point. I, it's this verse and how you were explaining it because I want to. I understand. I know what you're yeah. saying. I, I, so, I, I okay. got it. It's very clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things that you see with what happens with Christ is we've seen it in this past week with what happened to Harris and what happened to Biden. Right? Is that you get a few important people like Clinton and Obama and a few people like that start to say, Pelosi, that are indicating that he must resign, that he must drop his candidacy. And then all of a sudden, the other Democrats that may have wanted Biden, they're kind of afraid because there's other powerful people that are saying, you know, Biden should go. And so then you have these people that aren't willing to stand up for it and say, no, he's actually the elected person. And so then you get to the point where where you can create a, a groundswell that appears, but it's not. It's really that people are just afraid. And and this is what happened with Christ, right? In John twelve forty two and forty three, it says, "Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God." So the way that you can switch it, that you can all of a sudden have Kamala Harris be the nominee, who's Honestly, she's not a great nominee. She wasn't a great nominee four years ago, and she's no better now. And yet you can get this thing that in 36 hours, all of a sudden, everybody's saying she has to be the nominee. And a lot of it comes down to people are going, I'm afraid to stand up against the few powerful people that are pushing. And so but you get the mob to follow you, but you start by, by intimidating the other rulers, which is exactly what the, the chief priest did. But were there even people out there who were saying that President Biden is a great candidate and we love him and want to keep him. I mean, it seems very much like it wasn't a few. I mean, it was, le it was the leaders who did it, but it was, it seemed it's like. not even was, the ones who thought he was a great candidate. It's the ones who are saying we should actually follow the process and choose someone as opposed to just letting, even if you didn't like Biden as a candidate, the ones who should have stood up for it and said, no, we can't just subvert the will of the people like this. No one was willing to do that even. But I thought we're against the unfiltered will of the people. So isn't it isn't it better that they say we're the representatives, we're going to take a stand and say, no, we're not going to follow the will of the but people. By if they the were the representatives, vote. that would be true, but it's not. Right. It's already been decided without the representatives because they're all afraid of the leaders that are manipulating it. And so they're, 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 you know, the, the centralization of the, the power in the party is such that they're afraid to stand against the power brokers. I think they're pretty excited to get rid of Biden. I think a lot of them are, but I'm not, but I think a lot of them obviously are not with Kamala Harris tubing, which is, it was a double deal is he goes and she becomes the nominee. And so I think that there's a lot of people that aren't very happy with her being the nominee. There's a lot of people that are saying we will ignore our process and violate our process in order to get what we want. Well, they're saying that the will of the people is so important until they don't like what the will of the people is. And that's the problem with democracy is that you just manipulate people so they say this is their will. And look at what all the media is doing this week is saying how what a wonderful candidate she is when everybody knows she's horrible. Every, they, the people that have been saying things about her for the last four years are even now saying that they were lying before when they said it. And so they're, they're, they're falling all over themselves to, to control the people instead of actually letting a process work. What you should do is, just like the Electoral College of the United States, is that you're supposed to elect men that are then going to evaluate the candidates and say, this is the right candidate. But our system... Is it's all about manipulation of the masses. Right. It should have been but an it, open but, convention, basically. Yeah, but the people who do who were doing this were mostly elected representatives and not by the party, but by the Right, but it's a party district. decision and not a 
it's again, it's the they were you're right, they were congressmen and they were or the former presidents, you know. But the people that are supposed to have the authority to make these decisions are actually the people who were elected as representatives to the convention. And nobody was really standing up for them. There were a couple people here and there, but nobody of any significance. There were people who basically would just wanted to talk about the process a little bit here and there. That's all you really got. And, and having been at, at district conventions and stuff when those people are picked, it's it's all about appeasing the party. It's all about – it's 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 a system that you have all these people that at every level, virtually every level, you're picking these people who you think are – are supposed to be sitting there and reasonably debating these things and considering these things, but they're all kowtowing to the powers that be. I mean, that's that's basically the structure of our government now, which is a really dangerous structure because that is the, the danger that comes from democracy. Instead, they should ignore the will of the people and make a decision. Like, if they don't like the nominee, just get rid of him, no matter what the voters said. <laughs> Well, no, you oh, should. No, oh no, they can't do that. <laughs> they can't. But if you were electing people who could actually decide things and were put in there with the position to decide, and they they chose them, the reason that they said we have to ignore all the representatives is because they knew that the purpose of the representatives were somebody that would just say, you know, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, irrespective of anything else. And so they went to the convention. They would have. St so he. So President Biden says, "Well, let it be decided as an open convention. Anybody can vote." And he knew that everybody would vote for him, even if he was had a stroke and wasn't was in a coma. They probably would have still voted for him. That's the system that we have. Not a system of representation where that representative that's supposed to be voting for you are supposed to be saying what's best for the party in this case. That's not what they do. All they do is fulfill what they were appointed to do. And we've taken away this idea that, that they're supposed to be active agents that actually think and say, here's the will of the people, but I have more information, more understanding, more knowledge. That's why I'm in this role. And so I say, no, Joe Biden is not capable of ruling for four more years, so I'm not going to vote for him. I'm not going to nominate him. Because part of what you're basically saying is, while the Democrats had representatives who were voting, we've gotten so far away from the idea of what they're for that they don't select people who act. The purpose of the people is no longer to think. Even they just have the form of representation without right. the substance of it. And so, even though they have these delegates that are going there, those people are they're chosen as delegates like as a position of honor. It's like you award it to people, and it's fun, and you get to go, and you get to go up. You have to be willing to pay the money to go to the convention right. too. But but yeah. I mean, but but they get to go, and they get to do that. And it's all the guys that raise the most money is who the, right. who they usually appoint stuff like that. It's not as opposed to going. We're actually electing people who are actually going to think, who are actually going to decide, and actually have a role. And and you can see this as. This actually begins to affect the nation as a whole because while you're not supposed – while we don't want a democracy, a pure democracy, you want people who are thoughtful. You want people who are going to choose someone who can, who can think about the things that they need, not just the things that they want that can balance those things. I mean we talk about this in other episodes with things like this has affected family structure where women used to – they would marry a man who was going to be a representative for them who really was going to go into the world and think about what their family needed, not just what they had needed as a person, not what every individual needed, but how to actually decide what was good. And we've lost some of that idea is kind of what you're fighting, you're saying. And so, and all of that is bundled up when you think about this, but it's become massively simplified now because we're moving more to a pure democracy where it's just be or, manipulated. Or we think a pure, a pure democracy is good. Right. Even though, Structurally, we're not necessarily moving to it, but functionally, we are. Right. And think of the difference, right? So you go back nine months, right? Joe Biden was obviously already having problems. He was having, you know, significant problems related to aging. You know, nine months ago, before anybody voted, if they were voting for people who would then make a decision who to vote for at the convention— they would have, wouldn't have hidden the stuff with Joe Biden because when Joe Biden gets to the convention, all of a sudden he loses. Right. Right. I mean, it, it functionally changes a lot if you have an expectation that those representatives are actually representing and are actually going to think about it. Because then all of a sudden when they see Joe Biden at the convention. Hiding the and information not, will hurt you. Hiding the information hurts you. 
and then you don't get your the candidate that you want as opposed to the media was clearly hiding it the the leaders of the party were hiding it his the people around him were hiding it all of a sudden if you have people that are that are representatives and are actually thinking we need to consider who it should be joe biden wouldn't have been received the nominate nomination but also i think there's a good chance kamala harris wouldn't have either well the thing is too i mean what do they have like three thousand delegates about I mean, four. that's just a small democracy. It's not even, they're not even really representatives at that point. Right. And so they've just all been manipulated the same way. And so they're manipulated so that now they're stampeded within 36 hours through a motion they were stampeded into. You have to be for Kamala Harris. So now Kamala Harris says she's got it all wrapped up. Then what happens after, right? So you start to get the leadership going together because they're afraid. And then you just exercise power, Right. John 18, 3, then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. And so you then do a, a positioning of power to show that you have power, that you have some authority, and then all the people fall in line. I mean, this is just classic. This is just a classic way to do it, to manipulate people, to get them to fall in, is you get the leaders because they're afraid to stand against because they might lose their position. They want the praise of men more than the praise of God. And then you do something to show that you have power. You force Biden out, and then everybody falls in line behind you. And people should, you should be able to recognize this from the last several years. I mean, sometimes you can recognize it in small ways where you've been in a conversation about politics and there were people talking, whether it was about transgender issues, whether it was about all sorts, you know, but the, the tone of the conversation was such that you recognized you disagreed, but you also recognized that sticking your head out and saying something would probably just get you smacked around. And you were kind of torn over, should I stand up and, and make a stand? You could see it during the coronavirus. I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, North Carolina, Governor Cooper passed what were some really, I mean, unconstitutional under the federal as well as the North Carolina Constitution regulations. So a bunch of people went out to a parking lot. We were sitting in, standing by our cars, most of us social distancing. They brought the police out and they said, if you're still here in a few minutes, we will arrest you. And everybody scattered. Everybody ran. And I mean, the one lady stayed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that, but I mean, it was very interesting just watching. I mean, it, you know, and you go back and you read like the disciples, the way they flee. When all, I mean, this is how you do things. I mean, this, and, and it was really interesting watching that reaction. I mean, I was, I was angry. I was also going, I don't have time to get put into prison right now. You know, so I don't have time to go to jail. I got a bunch of kids. My wife's not feeling good. You know, I mean, but you're, I mean, it's very effective. It's incredibly effective. And so, I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that these things don't work. We've seen them on tiny little levels where we, where we really didn't have any fear for our lives. Imagine if you think they might actually kill you. What are you know, this is an incredibly effective way to push the people. And then what happens is as soon as that happens, the people feel guilty about it. And it's very natural response to feel guilty about it is to then start to explain that no, what you did was the right thing. And then you get a shift to the population. Because the population's that they're trying to say, No, I, I I wasn't scared. I didn't do it just because I wanted to please men rather than please God. They go, No, 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 it was the right thing to do. Right. And that's how you shift. That's how you shift a mob. I mean, this is just this is mob manipulation tactics, and that's why democracies are so bad because people are really easy to manipulate. And this is when you look at when you look at Donald Trump as a candidate. One of the things that people talk about him is he is a very populist candidate. I mean, he is looking at can I can I move the the people? Can I actually get the people behind me? Can I get them to follow me? Can I influence them in a way? And and it's all well and good while you like what he's doing, but there's a real danger. It's like you shouldn't look at him and go that he's, you know, he's this pure, wonderful person who only wants good for everyone. And which, I mean, you look at Trump on abortion and it's a great example. First, he's pro-abortion and then he wants to get elected president as a Republican. He's like, no, you know, Roe v. Wade, bad. I'm going to get point judges that are going to overturn Roe v. Wade. I'm anti-abortion. We should even throw women in prison for having abortions. And now he's like, well, you know, some of these states are going way too far. I mean, you got to have some abortions because it's not principled. He's just saying, what do people want to hear? And I'll tell that to them on some of the most important issues in the country. Homosexuality as well. I mean, he's, yeah. 
And you have to recognize that what happened with his first election and his first term of office, a lot of it was the leaders were trying to emotionally move the people and he was simply better at it, right? Because right. the leaders, you look at all these people that go into his cabinet that then turn on him. Well, they, they were always against him. They were just thought that they could play the same games that they had played before, but he was able to actually emotionally move the people more than they could. And so he ends up maintaining his base and now growing his base. But it, it, it's all these techniques that aren't about saying what's good governance, what's the right thing to do. It's all about how do you manipulate the emotions of the people. And the thing is, too, a lot of it isn't a lot of what the, the our leaders do these days isn't as much even manipulating as in claiming that they're manipulating and claiming the people want me to do this when they're doing what they want to do to get reelected or to, you know, to be successful or because you know you always have you you go you listen to the speeches and the one can will be saying the people want me to do this everyone's telling me to do this you listen to the other person the people you know the other side the people are telling me to do this well the reality is like 40% of the country is heavily pro democrat 40% heavily pro republican you have some people in the middle and even as issues change it slides a little bit but it's not like the people are telling me this. The people want to ban guns. The people want to keep our guns. No, the reality is it's not like that. And you sh and there's a point where you don't even shouldn't even be appealing to that because you should be leading and saying I'm going to do the right thing and convince the people or try to convince the people that it is the right thing instead of saying the people want me to do this when the reality is you're just lying or you're just from a conservative part of the country and someone else is from a liberal part. And you're just, I mean, and those are all manipulation tactics that you're trying to manipulate people who they have, they have jobs to do. They have work to go do. They have, they have lives to lead. They have children to raise. They have all the, the usual things that, that consume time in life. And so they're thinking about it for five minutes a day. And so they're really easy to manipulate. And that's why democracy is so bad. Because if that's what you're looking to, all you have to do is manipulate people that are very, that are that are low engagement. They don't understand the situation. They don't understand the issues. They don't understand all the things that are involved. And so you can manipulate them through emotion. And we want to be manipulated because we want to feel like we're on the winning side. We want to feel like everyone thinks like us. There's a few people out there who hate the country and, the, and most of the rest of the people think like me or pretty close. We just need to convince them. But you know we don't want to be part of the remnant. We don't. We don't want to right. realize that people disagree with us. And yeah, that's the bandwagon effect, and that's that's clearly a technique that's used to manipulate a group of people. Is that, and that's why they have these rallies that they show. Look, twenty thousand people came out here. Look at you should be following him too, right? I mean, that's the whole game with the numbers that they post about how many people came out is because it's trying to use the bandwagon effect to say that the population's with us. Which, of course, is in a nation of 350 million people Nothing. is meaningless. You have 20,000 people come out means very little, other than you have a tiny percentage of people who are enthusiastic about you, which can reflect things, but doesn't necessarily. What it definitely doesn't reflect, though, and what mobs are horrible at is thinking. I mean, you do, a mob, I mean, we've we talked about this at the individual level in other episodes with your emotions, is when you have an emotion, a strong emotion, what you do is you think through that emotion. Your thoughts are channeled through that. And so you're really not thinking. And I mean, it's really interesting when you, because you've been looking at Christ. I mean, when you look at, when you look at Matthew 26, 64 through 68, Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? I mean, what you have to understand about this is Jesus has spent several years traveling all over Israel. There's probably, there's almost no one left in Israel who's lame. There's almost no one left in Israel who's blind. He's gone everywhere, and if people came out, he touched them and he heals them. He's healed lepers. He's preached. He's done miracles. He has cast out demons. He has sent his disciples out. They have cast out demons. 
Jesus has transformed the nation. There is no one in Israel who hasn't heard of him, who probably doesn't directly know someone who's been benefited by him. And all of these prophecies are specifically so people can identify the Christ. And so when he comes and he does all these things, this is the whole point of the blasphemy laws, is that anyone who says they're Christ and doesn't do these things, you reject. But Christ has done these things. And so when they're a mob, this is all the ruler has to do is he has to go. He says, what do you think? But he tears his clothes screams and calls it blasphemy and goes, he's saying the words think, but no one's thinking. No one's going, well, doesn't that make him the Christ? They're going, we know what to do here. We know how to be angry. Let's all be angry. We know how to respond. And this is a perfect example of what happens with mobs. No one's thinking until later. And, I mean, it's important to recognize what's going on here, right? Because the righteous, they don't reject Christ. Right. right, they don't join the mob. They don't, and so so part of the and reason is Pentecost. I mean, that's right, I mean, so, I right. mean that's like, that's what I mean. It's that balance, right? But what I'm saying is that there is there's you know his disciples don't all of a sudden go you're blasphemy. Right, the seventy that he sent out don't go you're blasphemer. You're a blasphemer. They're not saying that, right? So so part of it is that it's it's appealing to something that the people already want. There's only a certain limit that you can go with right. democracy to shift people. You can't like shift them to a different position. Even though Christ had healed them, they still hated the fact that he was gone and said things that they did not like to hear. But when you, you have go to eat to... my flesh and drink my right. blood. And so they so when he does the emotional appeal, it also gives them grounds to not think and just flow with the emotion because that's also what happens now that's also right. a way to manipulate a crowd is you can't push them to go in the opposite direction without a lot of work like jim jones does it with a lot of work he gets right. them that they'll kill themselves but like in a short period you kind of can only push them in the direction they already want to go but you help them make it you help them forget about why they wouldn't go there before but I think a lot of people are ready to put themselves into the 70 or into the 12. When you look at the description of the people at Pentecost, there were certain devout men who were dwelling in Jerusalem. These, I mean, these were... Right. They were the ones uh, they yelling, killed, crucified. Right. And so, I mean, so people need to remember fine. it's not the uneducated, the, the non-zealous. There were devout men who were shouting, crucify him because of this tactic. And so I think that's... I mean, it's just really interesting when you, and it's really easy not to connect those together and go, because I mean, I was, if I, I looked at how I behaved during the coronavirus and some of the stuff, I mean, even though I was pretty opposed to it, it's really easy to be influenced by those things. It is real, even just Especially to be, when you're doing fear, right? And when they say he's blaspheming, they're saying God's going to judge us for this. And so they're appealing to fear and fear is a, a incredible motivator. Our founding fathers uh george washington this is what he said it is one of the evils of democratical governments that the people not always seeing and frequently misled must often feel before they can act and so without that emotion they don't they don't give their impetus to the government and so what you end up doing is ruling by emotion which is where we are <laughs> that we're largely ruled by emotion Right. You look at the policy that President Obama had and the policy that President Biden had at the border, and they were both doing the same things with separating families. It was the Biden, Trump didn't change the policy, but yet they the media pushes an emotional narrative. And then all of a sudden people go, how can you do this? How can this is horrible for things that had been happening for years that nobody cared about. But it's the way that you get force from the people is by stirring their emotions. And that's the big problem with democracy. And when it says, if you notice the, his, in the quote, he says, the people not always seeing. I mean, this is, you know, there's a lot of times where you'll hear something happens in government and you'll go, that is so stupid. And it, and it doesn't, you might even be right in one sense, but then you start digging and you start finding out what's going on. And the more you find out, you realize, well, there were a lot of stupid things going on. There were a lot of stupid things that had already happened. And the decision that was made wasn't as stupid as, it seemed in the end. And in fact, I mean, there were other things that you didn't know about. There were things that were more complicated. There were, you know, as a father, you can see it where sometimes your children look at a decision you made 
and you know they don't understand the scope of what's being chosen. They don't understand the different pressures that are going on. They don't understand the long-term effects of things. And as a father, you have to sit down sometimes and tell them, and sometimes you just you don't have time to even tell them. Well, that's true for government. That's true with people. And so there's this part of where he's saying the people don't always see and they're being misled, and so the way you get them to act is you get them to feel strongly. Mm-hmm. And sometimes even good people with good intentions who go, I'm going to do the right thing, and the right way to do it is to get them to feel and go along with the good thing I'm going to do. There's a danger there. It's one of the evils of the nature of the government itself. And, and one quick example of that, um, which is, you know, with Kamala Harris, one of the things that they're coming after her is saying that when she was attorney general, she kept prisoners in prison past the end of their sentence so that they could, um, so to get free labor from them. Now, I looked into it a little bit and there's a, a lot more you could do look into it but it was that the, the supreme court had said the conditions in the california prisons are such that you need to free a certain percentage of your prisoners and she was refusing to free the prisoners so it was it, you could also look at it as she was standing up to the federal government imposing itself into what the the state government was doing and i you know there's like i said there's more you can get to it but the way that it's framed is very different from that, where the Supreme Court was saying, "Put criminals back on the streets," right? It's 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 a big it's a bit different, right? But but people don't think about that. Everything, if all you have to do is express things in a thirty second soundbite, then all you can do is stir emotions. You can't get somebody to reason. Like like back to the example I used about the kids in cages, right? That was the big thing. Well, the reality is, somebody that's sneaking with Mexico, if they know they'll get away with it if they bring a child up what will they do they'll bring up a child whether it's theirs or not and then all of a sudden they go oh you have to free them because they have a child well it caused all these people to come up with children that weren't their children now frequently the parents wanted them to come so that they get a better life in america etc but the consequences of that when you just make this thing of you know you show some pictures because we can do it a lot more effectively now we have video and we have you know we have pictures, so we can manipulate people that we could never manipulate. Or that, you know, as a society, we get manipulated in ways that previous previous societies did not. But it's completely unthinking. It's completely unreasoning. And look at you know, uh, you know, we're a day away or two days away from when Kamala Harris became the nominee or became the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party. In thirty six hours after. President Biden announces that he's ending his his run. She's the nominee already. So exactly how much did people consider that? How much did people debate that? How much did people deliberate about that? Or was that pure emotion? You don't get to that point unless it's pure emotion in 36 hours. Pure emotion is a really dangerous thing. You know, as Washington said, you move people by feel rather than by them seeing and understanding the situation. And, and they'll get burned by it. But a group of people were able to manipulate the, the Democratic process, the Democratic Party process. The Democrat Party process is actually the term, right? The Democrat Party process in order to get the nominee that they had chosen for whatever reason. And the reason it works is because self-control is a fruit of the spirit. And most people aren't saved. What is the path that leads to destruction? There are many who go by it. And so when you think about that, when you think about a division like it talks about in Galatians 5, 19 through 23, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. When you look at the sins of the flesh, they're all about not having self-control, or virtually all about not having self-control. Right? The adulterer doesn't have self-control with his lust. The drunkard doesn't have self-control with his lust for alcohol. You know, All these things, the murderer, he can't control his anger. Right, All these things are a lack of self-control. And so when you look at it, the mob always, the majority of a mob is made up of people who lack self-control. 
And so that means that you can move them through emotion rather than reason. So when you set up a system that allows people to, the mob to control the government, you can always connect, manipulate them through emotion because you're, you're dealing with the people that largely left, lack self-control. So that's, you know, biblically, that's why it's such a dangerous system. When you look at a lot of the arguments why people want to change the system, it's to allow, it's to allow for quicker, quicker resolving of our impulses. It's to allow us to, you know, I mean, and this is, this can be, the answer is in a bureaucracy where everything is inefficient. You know, I mean, it's, we should, you should be, but I think we've lost an idea of how much representation there used to be. You know, I mean, like where, you know, you would, you would elect representatives who then elected representatives for, you know, I mean, like in the way, you know, when the nation was founded, the Senate was elected by the state legislatures of each state. So you would elect state legislatures and those state legislatures would elect senators and the senators were, and so you have this double layer of representation and then the House of Representatives was directly elected. And so there was less of a democracy at that point. It was because there were there were multiple layers. And, and by even doing that level of indirection, you got greater degrees of thought. You got people who were saying, we want to preserve power to our state. We want to preserve rights to our state. We want to think long term about the nation, not just about the way the people think. And so, I mean, it's it's really interesting when you look at this. And you're tying this to self-control because I don't think this is what we realize. You know, I mean, it's like and and I and as I say that, I mean that's that's an important thing to understand. But also, the reason that you can have somebody else that does have self-control in that situation is because that's their focus, that's their gift, that's their that's what they say. I'm going to spend my life doing. I'm going to spend my life being a congressman. Well, they should be considering the issues far more deeply than the person who goes, I'm going to spend five minutes a day thinking about politics. Right. Right, it's on a whole different scale. And so it's not that you know, they lack self control, but their self control, I mean, it's it's also that's not what they should be doing. That's not what the focus of their life is supposed right. to be, because God does give people different work to do. And and when you say everybody should be able to do it, well, no. And the self control has to do with the ease at which people can be manipulated. You can see the same concept in the church where it talks about the elder who's set aside to the study of the word and the preaching. You know I mean, and so yep. everybody should be studying the word. Every man should be doing some, you know, should be leading worship in his home, but every man isn't set aside to the study of the word. Every man is doing that at the same degree. And every elder is not even doing that to the same degree. And so, I mean, there's this part of it where, I mean, it's like you're saying, I mean, it's, both in the sense of creating this level of indirection and also creating people who are focused and that's what they that's what they work towards whereas now because we've cut away, you think about what a senator would have done back then the senator would have been reporting back to a very different group of people than the populace if they were elected by the state legislature those people are going to examine that senator in a very different way than the populace is it's much easier to kind of put a smoke screen in front of the populace than it is a bunch of other guys who were set aside to actually examine him and see what he's doing. And you can see why the Senate was thought of as more of a statesman-like position. It had a, they were representing different interests than the House of Representatives were. It's, and even when you go down to the bottom level, it was different, right, where you had to own property or have to have some connection to the community where they gave you a blank piece of paper and you had to write the name of the candidates that you want. If you didn't know enough about the election to know who the people were, right. guess what? You couldn't vote. I mean, there were problems with it because obviously when the, the blacks are freed in the South, there were laws against them being taught to read before that. And so all of a sudden that would shift your population or your voting population. So there were problems with that. But we shouldn't forget the underlying issue, right? The underlying issue was they were going, wait a second, it should be people that, know enough to know something that have enough of a vested interest in this to be choosing who their representative should even be. Now we're saying you just take a group of people that even many who aren't registered to vote, or maybe they're registered to vote, but they haven't, they never vote. And then you turn around and count them and say, this is decides the will of the people. Well, those are like really people that are very ignorant of the issues. And so they're very easily manipulated. Right. And to think that they're not being manipulated. I mean, to think that it's not the idea of packing every single, the idea that just hearing what every single person has to say is a good idea. That's, 
that's not a good system just to say, hey, whether you know anything or not, just pipe up and say something. And you're you're that's valuable. But people in business do this all the time. Right. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody in business would just <laughs> oh, let the person who knows nothing go up there. I mean, they do it when they have full employee meetings that are a joke. That this is <laughs> That's just what I was thinking the about. same manipulation that happens in a democracy as businesses right. do the same technique where you get your thousand employees together and then you lead them into this. This Basically, it's a, it's a, a, pipe, a pipe rally, a pep rally, <laughs> a pep rally just like that they have in high schools and stuff where you're just trying to get people to – it's just the same game that's being played at a, in a political right. We want to hear from enough. everybody. We want everybody's opinion. And we're going to go in the other room, make and the decision, gonna make and we're going to tell you all that we, we listen to your voice, and you've spoken, and here's what we're going to do. But the Bible warns us about, about this whole idea of just going with the crowd, right? Exodus 23, 2, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. When people manipulate like that, and when people go along with the manipulation, they have to recognize that's that's sin in the eyes of God. And like the testifying in a dispute, so as to turn aside after many. I mean, you can see court cases where the jury is pushed, where people are, or the jury and other people are pushed to testify to turn aside with the public opinion. You can see cases where there's a tremendous amount of pressure to say. This is what we're all going to say. This is what we're going to accept. We're going to come to this conclusion. And if you don't come to that conclusion, we're going to destroy you socially. And God's saying people actually need to be able to stand up against it. Even though he's looking and saying many of you lack self-control, God's saying, I expect you to stand up for justice, even in those situations where you fear destruction. And this is happening too, right? I mean, you look at Donald Trump and his conviction in the, the Manhattan courtroom. I'm sorry. They wouldn't even name the crime. That's a really perversion of justice. You just can't get away from that. But yet, this is everybody's going with the crowd. You know, that's that's just a real way to pervert justice. And again, that was seen by our founding fathers. So James Madison said this: "Where a majority are united by a common sentiment and have an opportunity, the rights of the minor party become insecure." And so that's saying, you know, you have the risk that when you are only looking to the majority opinion that they can be, you know, trampling upon and abusing the, the people who are in the minority. I think at this point we want to move on and, and talk about what we can do about it, about how um, we, how government should be structured when you look at the Bible and uh, the right way to do it to avoid some of these, these problems of democracy and, and where people are, have this inclination to follow the crowd to do evil. And uh, it's something that I think some of these things will find uh, that the founding fathers understood and some that they didn't understand and some that they disagreed about because you definitely do have different um, strains of opinion in the founding fathers. You had some people who, who thought, you know, like, you know, uh, like a John Adams or Alexander Hamilton, that they were in favor of a stronger central government and, you know, thought that, you know, having a king might not even be that bad of an idea versus other people, you know, they are hoping that this, you know, democratic wave spreads across the world and they're embracing revolutions in France and South America that turn out to be very disastrous. So you, got, you do have de definitely different different parts of, of how much understanding there was of some of the biblical principles. Because a, a big part of the biblical principle is that there, you know, that there are authorities appointed by God. And that it's not that the people are the ones deciding everything. It's that the people are given a role in government, but ultimately authority is a important concept and that people do need to uh, submit to the authorities that, that God puts over them. And it's important as we talk about it because the example we're going to use is from when Israel leaves Egypt, but also recognize when the people got rebellious enough, God put a king over them. Now, he says that the right form of government or the ideal, I would argue, form of government is they accept that Jesus is Lord, that he's king, and that there's representatives underneath that. But yet at the same time, it doesn't mean that in any given time, at any given place, there might be another form of government that, that works better, right? David was appointed to be king. And so we shouldn't go, it has to be this way. But at the same time, we should look at the principles and go, it's a lot better than the system we have now. You know, the idea that the people are appointing the rulers it is kind of necessary to have things last long term. Because you, even you look at the history in like the book of Kings and you have 
sometimes the rulers come in and they try to change things and it does not last long at all. And other times you have the people involved and maybe it lasts a little longer. And there's actually an interesting example, you know, archaeology, archeolo- <laughs> maybe I should not use that word. There, there, In ancient digs. <laughs> there's, there's some guys out there digging. <laughs> So there's an interesting example of this, you know, in in Israel, a few years ago, they dug up one of these old cities from the time of the Bible. And I think it was thought to be from the time of Josiah, where um, they had, where Josiah had gone through and eliminated a lot of the idols. And so what seemed like the best explanation is they had this shrine in the gatehouse and he had turned the temple shrine to a false god into a public restroom. But they can actually do um, scans, even of 2,000-year-old bathrooms, and see whether they were used. And they found out it was not used, at least not extensively. So Josiah had come in, had made this into a restroom, that people don't use it, and then guess what happens? Not long after, I think the Assyrians come in and destroy the city. But, but there you have an example where the people were not actually on board with the change. And so a godly king, a Christian prince, as a lot of people now want to talk about, they can do some good, but if you don't, if the people aren't behind him, it's not, it's not long lasting. So it seems to me that the, the first principle, if you want good government rather than the government we have right now, it, it depends on the people that are chosen, right? It says in Deuteronomy one thirteen, choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And so Moses, when they come out, Moses is trying to rule everything, and his father-in-law goes, you're going to kill yourself, basically. And so here's a suggestion, and I think that's in Exodus 18, and then he's re- recapping that in Deuteronomy 1, and he's going, you know, basically, the point is, is that there should be a delegation of authority, but that delegation to be people that are competent for that delegation. We, we want to look and we want to talk about there being many parts of the body and, you know, that everybody's not a hand and everybody's not a foot. Well, when you... When you say that you should be democratic, you're saying everybody's a foot, everybody's a hand, everybody's a head. And that's not how God designed the world. And so there's people that might be a mighty warrior. Well, they shouldn't necessarily be the person that's the ruler over 50s because it doesn't mean that they have the wisdom to do it. And so what you want to do is look for those people that have the giftings for the role if you want good government. And you look at wise, understanding, and knowledgeable those are different. They're not, he's not just repeating the same concept. It's, those are different things. And they're saying that you should look for all of those in, in each person. I mean, they may, they're going to be in different levels, but I mean, it's not just that one person is just wise and has no knowledge. And has, I mean, it's, these things are together. These things, they re- it requires you to be a good leader. It requires you to have all three of those. I mean, there's the, you know, the great interviews where that they come out from time to time or sometimes in hearings where they, ask the candidate for office like very basic questions about their job that they do not understand and they're just revealed to be not wise or knowledgeable in any way and now sometimes they can be kind of gotcha in an unfair way but many people have been shown to be not qualified just because they can't answer basic questions about what their their job is these federal judges that don't know what the constitution says it's very common and it's a big problem because they're saying they're going to take an oath to uphold it and they don't actually know what it says in so many cases yeah or you have congressmen saying i'm going to do this like how are you going to do that you have no control over that <laughs> right and you see that because we're not looking for knowledgeable men we're not looking for ones that have understanding so that they run on these platforms where it's all a state issue, but yet they're running for a federal office based on a state issue, or they're running for a state issue, state office about something for the federal that the federal government does that they have no control over, but the people don't understand it enough, so they choose the issues that cause an emotional movement, and the people aren't going. Wait a second, he's talking about that as as the the next senator, he's going to cause this thing to happen in the state? No, he's not. He doesn't even right. have any role. The with governor that does that, right? But but that's it's all about shifting emotion and people don't go, well, clearly you're not qualified because you don't even know what the job is. Instead, they go, oh, he's going to solve our problem. And right now what we go f- with is, and Donald Trump in many ways, he has experience and he has wisdom, but in many ways he's pretty childish <laughs> and he, he has done a lot of foolish things in his life. And the Bible says you're supposed to look for people that have wisdom and have understanding and have actually put those things into use in a way that shows that they're governed. 
and that they can govern others, right? It says in the Bible that a man's not equipped to be an elder of a church unless he rules his own house well. Because the idea is that the people who are capable of ruling a larger group of people, they need to show that capability with a smaller group first. You know, it says in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So that's what you're looking for, somebody who's been putting these things into practice in their life so that you can then turn around and say they'll put it to practice in the government. I mean, and th this is an, an interesting, I mean, obviously this verse is talking about Christians in a sense here, but it's, it reminds me of actually an Exodus when, or not, sorry, not Exodus, it reminds me of Leviticus when Aaron is appointed as priest and the first command that God gives to him is about discerning between what is holy and unholy, between what is clean and what is unclean. And there's this part of it where when you look at people go, we're not, uh, we're not voting for a pastor. So much of what being a ruler is, is knowing what is good and what is evil, knowing what is clean, knowing what is unclean, knowing what will destroy the people, knowing what will, knowing what will exalt them, keeping them from going to those baser things that they desire and pushing them towards good things. And people want to pretend like that's not, that's not something they should be looking for in a leader. And I just, I don't understand it. It makes zero sense whatsoever. We've divorced what is good from the source of goodness. And specifically morality, right? Because what you want is the person who's wielding the sword to do justly, right? right? Because he's wielding the sword. He's putting people into prison. He's, he's causing a lot of torment of people. And so what you want first and foremost is for him to be moral. Right. And we've ignored that completely, right? I mean, you look at our, our current leadership, and that's usually not a criteria that the Americans are looking towards at all. They're looking towards who can manipulate my emotions. But God says if you want to have a country that has actual stability and has it prospers, you look for people that look towards God for what's moral. And, and a big principle, we don't have a verse that directly addresses it, but a big principle is the idea of total depravity, that people are contrary to what all the politicians tell you, people are not basically good. If you get a bunch of people together their evil tends to build instead of diminish. So it, it's something that you need to design a government that controls people's evil and with checks and balances, uh, put kind of pits one evil against the other. And then, you know, if you look at there's quotes from the founders where they understood this concept that the checks and balances mean that if one person wants to do something bad, you have another person with incentive to stop him from doing it, even though they not necessarily righteous a heart, not driven by a righteous heart, but by their own, you know, un, unrighteous heart. And and some of this is is the reason for um, the way that it was set up um, with, with Moses uh, in Deuteronomy one fifteen. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. And there you you have those multiple levels, and that that's part of constraining evil and part of checks and balances. Where if the leader of thousands is telling you to do something that you know is wrong, then as a leader of hundred, you might want to glorify yourself by saying no, we're not going to do that. And that actually now your evil is turned into being used for a good reason because now you have an incentive to stand up to other people's evil because you have this this tiered system of leadership. And if you do happen to have someone who's righteous, even more so that they'll yep. that they'll look at that's their job is to constrain constrain the evil of the ones above them and the ones below them. Unfortunately, Joshua and Caleb were spread pretty thin. They, they could were. only hold so many of those positions. Yes. <laughs> and so what we've done instead is everybody's supposed to kowtow to people higher than them rather than seeing it as a separate position. And so and I remember going to a school board and say, how can you be teaching children about all these sexual things? And their answer was, oh, the federal government has said that. We have no choice. We just do what we're told. This is what the state says. We're, we're the local school board that's made that's supposed to be representing the parents' rights. But we, no, no, no. They, all we do is decide if you build new buildings. That's all we do. And that's not how it should be, but that's how our government has become is that we have this appearance, just like we have this appearance of being a, rep a republic, but in so many ways we behave more like a democracy. We also have this, this appearance of having all these multiple levels, but in reality, a lot of them, the people just go, yeah, yeah, I can't do anything.
anything. There's a Department of Education at the federal level. I can't do anything. And a lot of that comes back to bribery, where the federal government is printing money and distributing it to the states and then the states to the local schools. And if you buck what they say, you might not have enough money to keep running your school because now you're relying on this money that there are strings attached to. And, it, and the Bible talks a lot about bribery. In Exodus 18, it's the conversation where, where Moses and his father-in-law are talking about how you should, how they should appoint people. And in Deuteronomy, it's the recounting of it. And we're looking at different aspects of kind of bouncing back and forth between Deuteronomy and Exodus here. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. I mean, there's a couple things in the very beginning of this that are really key. I mean, able men is something that gets missed. This isn't just, you know, somebody who fears God, but they're not capable of doing things. They're not actually able to produce. They're not actually actually able to solve problems. There are a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge. There are a lot of people who they're very useful in certain situations, but they're not they're not capable. They're not able to do things. They're not able to actually go out in the world and say, I'm going to accomplish this. And that's a really key point that I think gets overlooked a lot. It's one of the things Donald Trump's actually fairly good in the right. sense of he is an able man. Such a sphere of God. <laughs> you disagree? <laughs> we have a whole other episode about that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I understand what you're... If you compare him to the average politician, he's much more able than most of the politicians. He's closer to what someone has been able in the past. So I agree. Undetermined. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, such as fear God, men of truth. I mean. There's Donald <laughs> Trump. Wait a second. And I mean. I disagree. And, 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 yeah, and this, and this is. Nobody is. <laughs> I mean, men of truth is a really key thing. I mean, how many, how many conversations, how many contract discussions, do people just ignore what they've said and what they've agreed to? Did people say, we can just mark off and say we did that when they didn't do that, when the time to fight over that was six months ago, was a year ago, when the when the language was being hashed out, when the code was being developed, when they go, we just ignore this when we want to ignore this. Men of truth actually go, no, if we're going to agree to it, we're going to do it. And if we're going to do it, everybody's going to do it. And I'm going to require it of you. And I'm not going to let you, you know what I mean? And we we don't care about that. I mean, we just we've lost the value of what men of truth are. And hating covetousness, which is both in themselves and in others, that that they're just, that they don't allow people to to want what someone else has and to take it from them. And if you look at America, what we've become is we've become a nation driven by covetousness in so many ways. The rich have this, so we want to take from the rich. We want to give it to us. We want to, you know, all of this desire and envy that's been going on is is horrible. And I think you had mentioned earlier how, you know, that democracy is 51% ruling over and forcing their will on 49%, right? That's why you don't want covetousness, right? Because if you allow covetousness in your leaders, that's what it will always degrade to, is that the majority will impose their will on the minority because they want what the minority has. So they'll, they'll impose their will on it. And if that's what you're saying is we just want to find out what everybody's will and go with the mob, that's what the mob always ends up doing. Right. Instead, what you want to do is find people who aren't covetous so that they won't try to take from everybody because in the end that destroys the society. Because if you take from the people that are producing, you can look at this in countries in the world where it comes in and they go, oh, these people are terrible. We're going to take everything they have and now they're starving to death because you can't take everything from producers and expect to continue to produce. I mean, and when you look at it, people will go, it's not about covetousness, but you look, you, you get down to like education and you talk about wanting to do either vouchers or things. I mean, people go, no, no one can have a different, everyone has to have exactly the same education. If anyone else has greater benefits than I mean, they get, you know, when you talk about like someone not having to pay into public school or someone being able to go to a different school or magnet schools, charter schools, I mean, envy and covetousness is huge there. And it's not about finance. It's not just about wealth. It's about every single experience that someone can have. You can have covetousness for, and it can it it just destroys. You know, and this is why our government was established to be a republic, and it was explicitly to be a republic because they understood this. And you know, you look at Alexander Hamilton, and he wrote on this. Now, Alexander Hamilton, in a lot of ways, he was believed that the aristocracy should rule and other things. But he, 
he still expressed what was so bad about democracy. It has been observed by an honorable gentleman that a pure democracy, if it were practicable, would be the most perfect government. Experience has proven that no position in politics is more false than this. The ancient democracies in which the people themselves deliberated never possessed one feature of good government. Their very character was tyranny, their figure deformity. Unless you're willing to appoint men that will stand up and will stand in that position between different powers and the people, that's that's where you always degrade to. You degrade to tyranny. It's definitely one of the things where the church has I mentioned earlier we did an episode on total depravity and there was a point where the world had a greater understanding of the fact that man was depraved where the world fundamentally viewed man as someone that needed to be constrained and as that idea gets lost we want it's much easier to believe the fantasies our social fantasies that we have of like the democracy it's so easy for us to forget the role that the church plays in this that's a that's a church speaking to the world telling them what a man is telling them what righteousness is telling them how to achieve justice telling them how to avoid these things it's essential because otherwise man is just cast adrift and he'll believe almost anything right and this is something that the united states you know over the past few decades um, has been a big player in saying we want to bring democracy to the world. And actually, you go back, you know, long before that, and there's been those same elements where where we're saying, you know, no matter what the people, the solution for them is democracy. Well, are they, should they govern themselves? Will they have a better government if they govern themselves? In, in many cases, been, that's no. not true. Yeah, yeah, you can list example after example. Well, that was disastrous. Yeah, so in the U.S. Constitution, Article 5, Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislator or of the executive when the legislator cannot be convened against domestic violence. So there you have the requirement that the 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 states have a Republican form of government. And despite the archaic punctuation, that's small r, not Republican Party, but they need to have, be a republic. So if you had a state that said, we're going to change our constitution and now everyone will get on their phones and vote for laws, actually, the U.S. government is supposed to invade them and say, no, you are, need to stick with a republic and not a democracy. And that's how serious they, they took it when you... Look, at, at first there was arguments about you know, whether a state could leave the union and stuff, but the reality is the federal government had a responsibility to stop it from becoming a democracy. And now Biden is saying, I'm, do, I'm stepping down to preserve the democracy, which we don't have. Right. I mean, and so it's, it's, the terms are really important, and it's, it's important to remember as we're talking about this that people are trying, they're luring you to a baser form of government. They're lying to you and saying we already have it and saying, in fact, we have to protect it because we're destroying the thing we don't have. And they're doing it purely with emotion. Right. Like what's going to happen if Donald Trump gets elected? Right. As opposed to reason about talking about policies, about talking about the constraints on him. Because so what if he wants to be a tyrant? I have no doubt that, that President Biden wants to be a tyrant too. But there's all kinds of constraints on everybody in this government because the founders understood that the you know, total depravity. They understood there were checks and balances. And there's a huge number of checks and balances in our government. And so because of that, you know, they they make this appeal to emotion that's really totally false. And it's just a lie and a distortion. And they start with the lie that we're a democracy. And it's a, it's flattery. It's saying you're in control. Yeah, we're not is. the authority that God appointed through the process in the Constitution, we're not an authority. You're in charge. All we do is listen to you, right. unless you disagree with us. But we're not going to tell you that. So, what does the, the Bible say? The throat of a flatterer is a sepulcher, or something like that. Yeah. So off the straitjacket of the republic, so that you can do what's good, so you can just choose what is right and reelect me. <laughs> All <laughs> right. right, not not me, my vice president. Yeah, one of the things that De Tocqueville, he was a writer in the the early 19th century. Or is the will of the nation is one of those phrases most widely abused by schemers and tyrants of all ages. You know, because they go, this is the will of the people. This is the will of the nation. 
And one thing that we've been talking about, we've been putting this in the civil sphere. But at the same time, we should talk about how all these same things happen in the ecclesiastical sphere. And, yeah, that as I was preparing notes for this today, I was just considering that the number of times people have said to me, but you understand everybody in the church thinks this way. And it's like, no, you're the only one that thinks this way. <laughs> but right. you're out there telling everybody that everybody thinks this way to try to get a group of people to be moved with emotion rather than saying, what does the word of God say? And all these these techniques, we, we want to think that the church should determine what doctrine is instead of the Bible determining what doctrine is. Knowledgeable men, people who have studied the scripture, that's who you should look for to determine who, what doctrine is. You shouldn't look towards the person who was just baptized the week before to say, here's what our doctrine is. Because when you do that, when you have that democracy in the church, I mean, this destroys a lot of churches because you have these people come in and they become members and then you just try to come up with a doctrine that everybody accepts. Well, that's the same problem that our nation is suffering in, and that, suffer that happens frequently in churches. Right. You were kind of saying that people are out there saying everybody in the church wants this, and he mentioned schemers and tyrants. I mean, it's interesting how many people genuinely think that, I mean, the most common— But that's because they're sin. There, there usually oh, are schemers and tyrants, right. and their sin that's, has blinded them to their, that's to what their I was meaning, desire is, to be a tyrant. You may not think of yourself as a schemer, but it's your heart telling you that most people think the way you do. And when you even look at, you're even denying what God has said about people, is that he's made people to be fit together, that they're different. And and you want to go, no, we're all exactly the same. And God's going, no, I didn't make them to be the same. I didn't make them to have the same opinion. I didn't make them to have the same exact desires. I've actually made people to be different. And so, I mean, it's it's really interesting. I mean, it's a, actually a that view that everybody thinks the way I do is really a denial of the way God has made people. And so, I mean, when people go, I think all, all wise people join me in believing, but you know, it's such a, such a right. leading thought, such a leading statement. And the truth it's is a statement is, of ego. Yeah. People want different things. And sometimes the answer is you need to step back and realize that what you want isn't anywhere near as important as you think it is. No true American fallacy. No <laughs> true American would disagree with me. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, another thing that that as I was thinking about it, that it manifests itself is in you know when churches have business meetings. The number of pastors that tell me that they just hate when their church has a business meeting, because then everybody thinks that their opinion is as important as every as everybody else's, even when they haven't really thought about anything. Right? They just emotionally they hear something that they don't like, and I've seen this happen not not at the church that I pastor, but I've seen this happen where all of a sudden you have this emotion just tear carry the room away it's like give me a break the the person's not making any sense they're not reasoning but they're they're saying it with a lot of emotional appeal and the church falls for it and so this happens in churches a lot and this is why there's a lot of pastors who just say i despise having having business meeting of the churches where all the members tell us what we're doing wrong because in the end it just causes all kinds of dissension and doesn't like actually help anything. And there's no moving forward from it. I mean, and, 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 there, go ahead. and there's also a lot of tyrannical pastors who there need, are. who need that, who don't want to have a business meeting because they don't want to hear the truth and they don't want other people to hear the truth. Uh, they so don't want to both leave. are in there. I mean, that, yeah. cause I mean, cause when you said that this doesn't happen at our church, what I was thinking was what happens is, is you, there's two different things that war against it because there are times where, it starts, but you have two different things that go on. One is you have to create a healthy culture of rebuke. And you have to create a culture where you actually you you value you actually value the person who people don't like. Right. And those two things are really essential because there are times where each person the person needs to be able to say things. And if you have a pastor who's not willing to lead people through truth, let's talk that through. Let's explain that. There are times where somebody, I've seen times where somebody starts out and they're really thinking backwards on this and they start off and they're, they think they're obviously right. And you'll either go, well, let's let's walk through that. And if they're really belligerent, they will get rebuked. And not just by you, they'll get rebuked by other people. But the other people will also go, they, want it, they also recognize that the person has the right to say those things. And I've seen, I mean, it's, it's all those elements are necessary. And part of the problem is that right now what, most pastors, what churches want from a pastor is somebody that moves their emotions. Right. So if what they want from the pastor is somebody who moves their emotions, they're not in a good position to lead anyway. 
because they're they're already in the emotional manipulation business and the congregation's already used to being manipulated emotionally. So somebody else can come in and manipulate them emotionally and that just creates havoc, right? right. So that's that's part of the problem is instead of a culture that says, let's go back to the word to figure out what righteousness is, what truth is, what justice is. If you have that as an overriding theme, then a business meeting is fine because if you're willing to go back to scripture and say this is true, then if somebody rebukes you for it, well, you were corrected, and that's a good thing. When I first started going to church, you drove me crazy because I was used to being manipulated in certain ways. I mean, like I'd gone to, and I don't mean like I'd gone to a lot of different churches, visiting churches, and seeing mm-hmm. different styles of pastors. And you're used to the pastor who kind of has that mix of he can he can kind of bully people when he needs to bully them and be warm when he needs to be warm and really shut somebody down to this. You know, I mean, he had to be a politician. And there were times when we'd have meetings where you would go, you would throw it out and you'd say, so what do people think? What should we do? And I'm like going, oh, it's just, it's just madness. What does he do? You know, like, why is he let, just, oh, you're going to let people just You've been to business meetings like I was talking about where the pastors fear them. Right. And, and, and people, sometimes people didn't know and you would go, well, if people really don't know, here's what I think we should do. But there are other times where people would say things. Sometimes they had a good idea. And you'd and there was a part where your goal was to develop people to think. You wanted them to actually think. And you're like, if you have a thought, I want to hear it. If you don't have a thought, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. And maybe you can build on my thought. And, and sometimes I do that just to give people time where they're thinking so I can actually think about it and come I mean, up with a thought. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm just – but what I'm saying is, is it drove me crazy because I was going, you can't let people do that. But I realized – that if you don't let people do that, you never get people mature enough to think. You never train them to think. They've never done it. They've just played. They play this role where they're either like your, they're either your lackey who whacks people over the head when they need to be wha- You know, they they find their little niche in this unthinking process, and that's just disaster for the church. It's long term death. And when that pastor goes, there's no one left. There's just going to be another worse tyrant who was trained who wasn't as good as the first because he never had room to grow anyway. And so well, they, they import them. That's, what that's you have usually to do what happens. Because they, is you they just weren't growing them. anybody of any worth in the building. And so, I mean, I, I just, it's really interesting how this is what we've become as a nation. We did, we look was when it says wise, knowledgeable and understanding. The first thought people have is, Oh, I wish there were some of those. But the reason we don't have any is we don't grow them. Right. The church doesn't try to develop them. It doesn't think that it has the responsibility to develop them. Right. When we look at the breakdown of government in our country, which we are seeing, if you pay any attention, you can see that, that our government is breaking down in many ways. It's growing. It's it's filled with covetousness. It's filled with injustice. All these things. It's not protecting the rights of the minority. But we should recognize all these things are starting in the church. But the church has a responsibility to set the example and to testify to these things and to make men that are wise and knowledgeable and have understanding of how the world works because they understand the God who created the world. And when the church doesn't say, wait a second, we shouldn't be ruled over by emotion, we shouldn't be ruled over by by men that are just more charismatic. Instead, what we should be ruled by is the word of God. Until we accept that, we should not expect this country to change. But the church can change this country. If we go faithfully and study the word and apply the word, the country will change. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.